Ricky, we're going to take our first look at a chi-squared test for independence. There are similarities to the goodness of fit test, and obviously there are differences as well. Um, and the fundamental difference is that you're looking at two categorical variables instead of one. So as I read through this, try and decide either what land are we in, mean land or proportion land, or, or more specifically, what is the variable? All right, so a Pew Research poll asked a random sample of adults if they currently own a gun. Here are the responses broken down by the respondent's level of education. All right, so we see all this data, right? Using a significance level of 5%, conduct an appropriate test to determine if there's an association between education level and gun ownership. All right, so let's take a moment and see, okay, what was the variable here? What was I asking each of these 695 people? Well, I was asking them whether or not they owned a gun, so yes or no, right? And then I was asking them, what kind of education did they have? High school or less, some college, bachelor's degree or higher. So you can hear there are two categorical variables here, right? Gun ownership and education level. So this is our first time where we have two categorical variables. And again, all of these numbers in here are frequency counts, right? So anytime you have frequency counts, you know you're gonna move over to proportion land. But another way of figuring out you're in proportion land is you have categorical variables. So let's just summarize this with, with that flow chart that we have, right? So we read the problem, we decided we had a categorical variable, and in fact, we had two of them. And there were a lot of categories, all right? There were actually six of them in here. There was the category of owning a gun in high school, not owning a gun in high school, some college and owning a gun, some college and not owning a gun bachelors or higher and owning a gun, bachelors or higher and not owning a gun. We actually had six categories in here, right? There was a lot to take in in that two-way table. So we're down here and we had two categorical variables. And you can see we have a table now of observed data. It's not just one row or one column. We have a full-on table and we're gonna run something called a chi-squared test for independence. Or you could call it a chi-squared test for association. So let's, let's take a look at how this is gonna play itself out. So we are in prof land, okay. We have two categorical variables. All right, and we actually have six categories here, six categories. Okay, so I'm gonna run a chi-squared test. So I'm gonna lead us through how we run this test, and then we're, we're gonna formalize everything on the next page. So step one would be to define all of your parameters. And you can almost start to feel how cumbersome this would be. Like, I would have to do the proportion of owns a gun in high school, proportion of not owns a gun in high school. Like, there would be a lot of proportions. I'd actually have to define six of them. So. We're just gonna skip step one, all right? This will be the only test, the only one, where we will skip step one. So skip for this test only. Okay, only this one. As we start to move through these chi-score tests for independence, I mean, you can start to imagine, what if you had a, a, one of your variables had five categories and the other one had four? You'd be defining 20 variables. It's just not worth it. So this is gonna be the time that we skip step one. This will be the only test. All right, and for the null and alternate, they also differ in that we will use words to write these up. All right, so we're gonna say here that education level, right, our first categorical variable, education level and gun ownership status are independent. All right, now independent falls in the null because the equal sign has always fallen in the null. And what we're trying to say is all things are equal. Whether or not you own a gun, the same proportion of people own a gun regardless of whether they're in high school, college, or bachelor's or higher. And same thing is true for the proportion that don't own a gun. You're, norm, you're no more likely or less likely to not own a gun 
if you have a bachelor's degree versus if you went to just some college, right? So all things are equal across these two categorical variables. And since there are so many categories in here, we can't write it out in symbols, we write it out in words. But independence always falls in the null. We're gonna assume, again, that your education level has no effect on whether or not you own a gun. And I got this data a couple years back because um, gun control has been in the news a lot um, in the past, well, I would say in the past 20 years, but definitely in the last few years. And I personally was curious, did education level have a role in gun ownership? And my initial bias was that it did. I assumed for whatever reason that the more educated somebody was, the less likely they were to own a gun. And I wanted to see if my bias had any data to back it up. Is that That's how I handle things. If I think something's true, I'm gonna go find a a couple of studies out in the real world to see if my bias is correct. And I can't tell you, there's times when I'm right and there's times when I'm wrong. And it's a real nice reminder actually for when I'm wrong. Um, just, to, you know, a reminder that, man, I don't, I don't have all the answers. All right, so on the alternate, we would say education level and gun ownership are not independent. So I'm gonna start using quote marks. Education level and gun ownership status are not independent. All right, and you might write the phrase dependent, but I, I'm gonna go with just the complement to not independent and, and write those two words out. Okay, so step four, we're gonna pick our alpha level. Um, I would default to 5%, but I also gave you 5% in this case. All right, so let's go ahead and do our alpha level at 0.05. All right, now let's talk about our assumptions. This is gonna be a good time. All right, so for assumptions, I do need a random sample, which it was stated, so I'm fine with that. But the real fun kicks in when you're doing a chi-squared test for independence in terms of how do you get your expected counts? All right, now it's a lot different from the chi-squared goodness of fit. There's no n times p that's gonna work here. So I'm gonna write a formula down. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna put my assumptions here so I can get it all in the same view as I'm doing this. So give me a moment just to erase this. But I need the table to be within view as we actually check these assumptions. So let me move this down so the table's within view and I'll put my assumptions right here. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the expected counts and you're gonna hear me talk about row total times column total over grand total. All right, and I will officially put this formula, it's on the next page, but I wanna work it right now. All right, so when you do expected counts, it's not n times p anymore. It's a lot more intricate. So here we go. This is how this is gonna work. I'm gonna put my pencil here. All right, in this cell, let me get my hands out of the way. All right, so let's take a look at row total. Ooh, gosh, sorry, I can't handle this. All right, maybe I'll just put my pencil there. Well, that works just fine. All right, row total times column total over grand total. If my pencil's here, the row I'm in, the high school or less, has a total of 273, okay? The column I'm in, owns a gun, has a total of 218. And the grand total, this number in the bottom right hand corner is 695. So I'm gonna work this formula, all right? So we're gonna, let me clear this out. We're gonna do row total of 273 times column total of 218. And I'm gonna divide that by the grand total of 695. And I'm gonna get 85.63. So in terms of the expected counts for owns a gun but are in high school or less, I expected 85.63. And the standard stats notation is that we put that in parentheses. And just for the sake of not making myself nuts, I'm gonna just go one decimal. So we're gonna say 85.6. Okay, that's not too terrible. I expected 85.6, I saw 85, that's looking pretty good. All right, let's work this for this next cell. All right, so I wanna do row total 
times column total over grand total. Now, if my cell is here, I've got own a gun, but some college. All right, row total, this time 300. Column total, still 218. Grand total, still 695. So I'm gonna go 300 times 218 over 695. So we're gonna go 300 times 218 divided by 695. And this time I get, what, 94.1. Okay, so I'm off by about eight. But eight out of 102 just isn't that much, relatively speaking. All right, if I put my pencil here, bachelor's degree or higher, all right, but owns a gun. So we go row total 122, column total 218, grand total 695. So we got 122 times, oops, 218 divided by 695, and we're looking at 38.3. All right, off by about seven. That's a little bit more relatively speaking, but it's still not that bad. Okay. Let's go over to the does not own a gun side of things. So does not own a gun, if I go in high school or less, we got 273 times 477 divided by 695. So we'll go 273 times 477 divided by 695. We've got 187.4. It's again, pretty close. All right, here I'm gonna go 300 times 477 divided by 695. So I'm just gonna start being more efficient with my calculator, oops. And that one was 205.9. And it looks like the last one I need is 122 times 477. And we got 83.7, okay. Now, before we move on, right? First off, all of the ex expected counts, they're greater than or equal to five. So I'm just gonna put that for my assumptions. I have gone through all of my assumptions. All of my expected counts are greater than or equal to five. Okay, and again, just notationally, we always put them in parentheses to the right of the observed uh, to the right of the observed counts excuse me all right so we got that going on great all right so before we move on from here i just want to show you some of the the numbers we've got if i were to take these top two numbers in that row if i take 85.6 and i add to it 187.4 what do i get 273 so if there was no relationship between education level and gun ownership status Right? That's how the numbers should have played out. And they were pretty darn close, right? 85 and 188. If you take 94.1 and add it to 205.9, what do you know? It adds up to 300, right? So this is off a little bit more, but, but not too much. Or you could add a, a column, right? Let's take 85.6, add to it 94.1, and then 38.3. What does it add up to? 218. And it should. This is what the null is telling us should happen. Right? This is what we expected, and this is what we observed, and we're going to compare them. All right, so moving on, step six would be to run a chi-squared test. Step seven is going to be a chi-squared test for independence. Okay. All right, step eight would be degrees of freedom. Now, degrees of freedom also has a different formula here. It's not number of categories minus one. Now it's number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. So in this case, for education level, I had three rows, high school or less, some college bachelors. So I had three rows. So this is going to be three minus one times, all right, number of columns. I had two levels, two categories of gun ownership so this is gonna be times two minus one, which will equal two times one. So I actually had two degrees of freedom here, okay? Okay, so now let's go mess with our test statistic, all right? So here we go, my test statistic, step nine. Oh, I'm running out of space, let me move this up. All right, um, there we go. I think I got that. Okay, so we're gonna run chi-squared will be the sum of the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. Now, for step 10, 
I'm gonna fill in my numbers. And again, of course I'm gonna use the dot, dot, dot. So I'm gonna start with the first category and go to the last. So for me, the first category is owns a gun and goes to high school, right? Or had a high school education. So I'm gonna do observe minus expected squared divided by expected. I'm gonna do the plus dot, dot, dot and end up here. And I'm gonna do the 91 minus 83.7 squared over 83.7. So when I say plus dot, 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 I'm gonna go from my first category over to my last category. Okay, all right, so let's try this. So here we go. For a high school or less owns a gun, we had observed minus expected. I'm gonna square it and I'm gonna divide it by the expected plus dot, 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 plus we're gonna go observed 188 minus 187.4. I'm gonna square it and I'm gonna divide by 187.4. And then I'm just gonna tell you, you're gonna just take a leap of faith with me for right now. This is gonna be 2.984. All right, and I'm saying take, take a leap of faith with me now because I'm, I'm gonna come back to how I got that number on my calculator. I did not add up these six contributors. There's no way I wanted to do that. But with that being said, let's figure out our p-value. I wanna do the p-value the old-fashioned way. All right, so we've got our p-value. We know it's a probability. All right, it's chi-squared. Chi-squared tests are always right-tailed tests. So I'm gonna go greater than, and I'm gonna do my number of 2.984, okay? So we're gonna go chi-squared CDF. It's always low, high, degrees of freedom. So let's go low, 2.984, high, 189.9, and I had two degrees of freedom. And since we've used this calculator command before, let's just take a look at it. We'll go chi-squared CDF, and it was 2.984 to infinity, and I had two degrees of freedom. So when I run that number on my calculator, I'm looking at about 22%. All right, so we'll go 0.225. All right, now for my graph, we're gonna have that right skewed graph. We're not exactly sure what it looks like, but we can get a pretty good idea and be happy with it. So I'm gonna get my ruler out and then let's go graph this. Let me move this up a bit. All right, so here, Now, I'm gonna label this chi-squared, okay? I know that the degrees of freedom just comes a little bit below, or excuse me, to the right of the peak, so maybe here. And then my chi-squared test statistic is maybe here, about 2.984. All right, so let me go ahead, and I should be shading in about 22, 23% of the area under my curve. All right, now from there, am I gonna reject or fail to reject? Well, we're gonna fail to reject because our p-value is larger than 5%. So because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H0. All right, so what that means is I did not have sufficient evidence of an association between education level and gun ownership. Or I could say we do not have evidence that education level and gun ownership are not independent. And that's a lot of nots in there. That's why I say we could just write, we do not have evidence that there is an association between education level and gun ownership. Which as I mentioned before, going in on this, that was a surprise for me, right? I was, I was actually getting data to, to show that my bias was incorrect. It, Based on this example or this random sample of adults, your education level has no bearing on whether or not you own a gun. So I found that really interesting. So I'm gonna use this phrase, right? There is an association between education level and gun ownership. So there is not sufficient evidence that education, that, oh, excuse me, there's not sufficient evidence of an association between education level and gun ownership status.
And alternatively, if you wanted to, this would be a mouthful, but you could say there is not sufficient evidence Let me just put this as a different version, right? There's not sufficient evidence that education level and gun ownership status are not independent. And again, for me personally, it's just my slight preference to do it this way, just because this has the two knots in it. That just seems like a lot of shenanigans to jump through. Mm. All right, so you took a leap of faith with me on this, all right? I, I asked you to just pretend we got to 2.984. I asked you to just assume this is what our chi-square curve looked like, our basic one. And now I'm gonna flip to the calculator. All right, we're gonna see how our calculator could have helped us out and then see if we needed to clean up any of our write-up. All right, so I'll, I'll catch you in a bit, bye. Okay, let's establish the rules for the chi-square test for independence. As I mentioned in example nine, we will have words in our hypothesis tests, our, our null and all, our alternate rather than symbols. So we're not gonna have the mu's and the p's like we have been, we're gonna have words in these. So you have three variations here. You could say the two variables are independent and don't write two variables, you know, write the context. We were doing education level and gun ownership status, for example, nine. So again, they could be independent, meaning all things are equal. Gun ownership status has no bearing on education level or vice versa. You could say the two variables have no association, all right? So education level is not associated with gun ownership status. Or you could say the two variables have no relationship. Right? So there's no relationship between gun ownership status and education level. So you have three options. I typically use the independence one. That's the one you'll see me write up the most often. Um, and probably the next most common one is no association. But I have been known from time to time to throw in no relationship. So you have three options. Pick which one you want. I typically choose the option that matches the wording of the problem. So I usually look at what I'm asked to do. If it says something about independence, I'll use independence. If it says association, I'll use association. If it says relationship, I'll use relationship. But all of them are correct. So pick one and stick with it, or pick a couple and stick with them. And then the complements are down here on the alternate, right? So we say if the variables are independent in the null, they are not independent in the alternate. If they have no association in the null, they have an association in the alternate. If they have no relationship in the null, they have a relationship in the alternate. So you, you match these up. So these two go together, this null and this alternate, this null and this alternate, or I'll use a triangle here, this null and this alternate. Those are your three pairings. And like I said, pick one, pick a couple, see what works for you. All right, so then we have our assumptions. So let me move this up so we have a better look at the second half of what's going on here. All right, so for our assumptions, we still want a representative sample or a random sample to remove some bias. We want all of our expected counts to be greater than or equal to five, and we have a more convoluted formula now. So every expected count, when you put your pencil in that cell, for each individual cell, you'll be in a specific row and a specific column. So you take the row total, multiply it against the column total, and divide it by the grand total, the total surveyed. And this will always be the number in the bottom right-hand corner of your table. So row total times column total over grand total, all right? And then we have our chi-squared test statistic. It's the same formula as the goodness of fit observed minus expected squared over expected. All right, we have our p-value. Again, we're gonna use chi-squared CDF this time. Um, it looks like, yeah, so I have compute as area under chi-squared curve to the right of the calculated number in step 10. And here I'm gonna mention the degrees of freedom. It's number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. And we will always be doing a right-tailed test. And the mean is the degrees of freedom, and it's usually just to the right of the peak. Um, I forgot to mention in terms of deal breakers, this is the deal breaker assumption. All right, 
there's our deal breaker assumption. If the expected counts aren't greater than or equal to five, then we, we wanna go ahead and stop the problem. Uh, so we've got deal breaker, and then we've got our p-value. We're gonna use chi-squared CDF. We're always gonna do a greater than um, on our probability because chi-squareds are constructed to be positive, so we'll only ever do a right-tailed test. And when you go to graph this bad boy, right, this is your basic chi-squared curve, and then your mean, again, just below, or just to the right of the peak. When it comes to making your decision, it's the same as always, all right? So we will make our decision based on comparing our p-value and our alpha. If your p-value is less than alpha, you're gonna reject the null and have sufficient evidence for the alternate. If it's greater than alpha, fail to reject the null, do not have sufficient evidence. And I mentioned this before, but I love repeating myself. These two write-ups are super similar, all right? The only difference is four words. We put fail to here, and we put do not here. And let's just remind ourselves of the different types of chi-squared curves. Typically they look like this skewed right, this unimodal skewed right curve. And you can kind of see that here. I know it's harder to see um, in, in this photocopied version. If you go to the actual PDF file up on Canvas, this is all printed in color and it's easier to distinguish the different curves. But initially the curves look more like a hyperbola. And I mentioned this before, if you've taken some math Hyperbolas tend to look like this on your x-y axis, all right? And, and a chi-squared curve looks like this top half of the parabola. So here, I'm um, sorry, not the parabola, the hyperbola. So this k equaling one, when you have one degree of freedom, it comes down from the y axis and kind of goes asymptotically close to the x axis. And as the degrees of freedom increase, you can see the peak here, it's starting closer to 0.5 and then coming down along the x-axis where this, if I extended it up, is a little bit higher. Keeping in mind, it'll never go over one because probabilities never go over one. And then once you get to k equaling two, this peak comes so far down, it actually converges to the origin. And you get your typical chi-squared looking curve, the one that looks more like this. And then as the degrees of freedom increase, you can see we're going from three to four to six, then to nine, this, this curve, it's less and less skewed right, and actually it looks more like the normal bell curve. You, we can't see the entire bell here because I haven't extended the x-axis far enough, but it does look more and more normal the more degrees of freedom you have. But this is a typical chi-squared curve, so if you wanna just play it safe and always draw that one, that's fine. Make sure you label it chi-squared, and make sure I always see your, your test statistic from step 10 hanging out on your x-axis. All right, so with that, let's take a look at how the calculator works for example nine, and then we'll wrap that problem up. All right, thanks guys, bye. Hey guys, let's take a look at how we can run a chi-squared test for independence on our calculators. Now, everybody has this, so it's not the TI-83s don't have it and the TI-84s do, all of us have this. So the deal here is once you leave one dimension behind, and when I say one dimension, that's when we had one row or one column of observed data. And here we have more than one row and more than one column. So we're way beyond one dimensions here. Um, your calculator can't put that type of information into a list because lists are just one dimensional, right? One column. Um, but we do have a different place we can put it and it's called a matrix. And I mean, the older I get, the less funny this joke gets about going into the matrix. It was great in the early 2000s because those movies were popular. But if you look over this reciprocal key here where my, my mouse is floating around, you'll see the word matrix and it's in blue. So we're gonna go into the matrix. Okay. And for right now, mine are all blank. Yours might be blank. They might have some data in it. It doesn't really matter. So if you see numbers here, no problem. Um, it's fine, we would edit it out anyways. So just take note that both A and B are blank right now. And, and I'll be referencing matrix A and matrix B. So let's go over to edit and hit enter. So we're going to edit matrix A. So what this looks like is the first thing you need to do is get a, a, a matrix in here that looks like the matrix given to you. And you might be like, well, what on earth is a matrix? Again, it's just a multi-dimensional way of representing data. It's a table. So we wanna get our table in our calculator to look like the table I gave you. So this is how it goes. You wanna put your number of rows first. So if we look, we had three rows of education, right? We had the category of high school or less, some college or bachelor's degree. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna type in three. And you can see now my matrix has the three rows in it. The second number is columns, right? And I have 
two categories for gun ownership. You either own one or you do not. So I'm going to type two in here. And you can see now I have a table or a matrix in my calculator that looks like the matrix that was given to me on my problem. Don't put the totals in. You don't need to have the totals going in here. All right, your calculator is more than capable of doing the total, so you only want to put in the observed data. All right, so I only want to put in the 85 and the 188, not the 273. Again, your calculator can add, that's fine, that's nothing for your calculator to do, so we don't ever need to put in the totals. So we're going to enter in all of those observed counts. And the way your calculator does it is it goes by row. You might want to go by column, but it's just not how Texas Instruments program these things. All right, 198, give me a sec to put all of this in. So you can see that the table in my calculator does look like the table that was given to me in the problem. Now inevitably, at some point you're going to put the wrong dimensions in. It happens to the best of us. Like you'll you'll look at this table and you'll say, "Oh, you know, maybe it was a 2 by 3." You'll forget which number goes first. And if you look, right? If you look here, if I try 2 by 3, the table here doesn't look it doesn't have the same shape or dimensions as the table in my problem. So if that happens to you, just flip the numbers. All right? Until it looks like something that it's supposed to look like. It's going to happen at some point. So no biggie. If it happens, now i got to re-up my data. There we go. All right, so from here, things are going to go real fast. Now, just I'm going to go back to my home screen, okay? But before we go, you don't have to follow me on this. I just want to remind you or take a look. You can see right now in matrix A, I have a 3 by 2, and I just want to remind you that matrix B is blank. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and we'll all collectively run the chi-squared test together. So let's hit tests excuse me, stat, go over to tests. And again, we're getting towards the end of this book, so most of the tests that we're doing are towards the bottom here. I'm actually going to scroll up. And depending on if you have the 83 or 84, um, you might have the Goff test, but all of us have the chi-squared test. So we need to activate chi-squared, but not the Goff version. So I'm going to hit enter. And the default is, hey, was my observed in matrix A? And it was. That was the matrix we edited. And I'm going to talk about why this expected B shows up. We're going, to, we're going to get to that, okay? So if you just put your observed data in matrix A, this default screen is going to always serve you well. So let's go down and hit Calculate. All right, and there you see my test statistic, the one that I told you to just trust me on, the 2.984. There it is. There's my p-value. We had gotten that using chi-squared CDF but you can use um, your calculator's output screen. There's your degrees of freedom, right? We had talked about how degrees of freedom is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one, but your calculator will give that to us. I always recommend going back through and running this, oops, let me hit stat again, excuse me, stat, test, go hit the draw option, just so we can make sure, wait for it, that we had the right looking graph, all right? And as we graph this, you can actually see it's not one of those unimodal peaks that's skewed right. It's one of those hyperbola looking things. So I would just want to adjust the graph that I had drawn when I hand wrote it. So this is a chi-squared curve. It's definitely still skewed right, but it's not starting down here in the origin and then peaking out. It's just coming all the way down from the top of that probability y-axis. You can still see my test statistic, and there's my chi-squared um, label. Okay, so the thing I want to reference back to, we spent a good chunk of time when we were doing this by hand getting all of these expected counts, right? We were doing row total times column total over grand total, and that can get a little cumbersome. I mean, we had six categories here. Imagine if you had like 15 or 25 categories to sit there and go row total times column total over grand total again and again and again can be a little bit annoying. So I had mentioned I would come back to this idea that matrix B had something in play. So let's go back into our matrix, and I want you to see that matrix B has now got some numbers with it, right? Before it was blank, but now it's got a 3 by 2. If you go over to edit and scroll down to matrix B, if you go into it, these numbers should seem pretty familiar. 85.6, 187.4. 38.3 and 83.7. So your calculator is super awesome in that it will calculate all of those expected numbers 
for you. So the row total times column total over grand total, calculator's got it taken care of. Now that isn't to say I won't find a multiple choice question to be able to test you to see if you remember that formula. But if you have the raw data, you can absolutely use this matrix and your chi-squared test to figure it out. So let's just go back and look at that interface for a moment. Did I hit enough? There we go. So it's saying if you put your observed in A, your calculator will drop all of the expecteds for you into um, matrix B. And anytime you want to put a new problem in, just go ahead, go in and overwrite whatever's been there. So let's say my next problem had, I don't know, a five by three. I would just overwrite what was there and enter my new data in. All right, so that's how you, you use your chi-squared test on your calculator. All right, I'll see you in a bit, guys. Bye. Okay, so before we get out of this problem, I just want to review up our calculator commands. Anytime you have more than one dimension or more than one row or one column of observed data, you've got to put your data into matrices. All right, lists are one dimensional, and then anything above that, we have the matrix for. So let's remind ourselves how we get into the matrix. It's in blue, uh, or at least it's in blue on the TI-84s above the X to the negative one key. So I'm gonna hit second and the matrix. And you can look right now, it looks in this calculator that matrix A has got four by two as its dimension, B is empty. Okay, great. Let's go edit out matrix A. You need to put in your number of rows first and your number of columns second. So if we look back at my original work, let me get the calculator out of the way, I had three rows and two columns, okay? So this is a three by two. And once you enter this in, check to see if this matrix looks like the matrix you have. And eventually, one of you, right, will enter it the wrong way. You'll put two by three. It happens to the best of us. If you put two by three, if you look, this matrix does not look like your matrix. So if that ever happens to you, just change the dimensions, flip-flop them, and then get to the one that matches the matrix in front of you. Now you always wanna put in your observed data and only your observed data. Don't put any totals in. Your calculator is more than capable of putting totals in, so you don't need to do that. And your calculator, the way it inputs matrices, is it goes by row from left to right. You might wanna put them in one column at a time. That's great, your calculator just, it wasn't created that way. So just be aware that that's, that's happening. Okay, so once I do that, once your stuff's in, it's pretty sweet, right? We go over to stat, tests, everybody's got the chi-squared test. Not everybody has the chi-squared goodness of fit test, but we've all got the chi-squared test. So let's just run this. All we gotta do is leave these in their defaults. All right, if I hit calculate, there's my test statistic, there's my p-value, there's my degrees of freedom. And if you go back into your matrices, oh, there's matrix B, I can go find all of my expected counts. So I don't actually have to do row total times column total over grand total. But I will test you on it to make sure you know that, that formula, but at least your calculator can help you with it. And the only other thing I wanna check is I wanna make sure my graph was correct. Because like I said, there's some variability with what the chi-squared graphs look like. So let's see, ooh, looks like I still have a box plot on. This is one of those hyperbola looking chi-squared graphs. So I'm just gonna adjust my write-up since my calculator can help me out of this. I put the just basic standard chi-squared bumpy one on there. And this is more of the matrix, uh, not the matrix, excuse me, the hyperbola. And if you remember, if you're thinking like, what on earth does that, is that talking about? Or does that, that Y axis, what is that? Keep in mind that probability, ooh, I can't use my words, probability is always along the Y axis. So that graph, since I adjusted it, looks a lot more like the one on my calculator. Okay, so with that, we, we're gonna pick up all of the rules, the official rules for the chi-squared goodness of, excuse me, chi-squared test for independence. And then we're gonna look at some data from the Titanic. Yes, the movie, that, or the, the, the incident, the boat that was based on that movie in 1997. All right, I'll see you guys in a bit, bye.